So, battery storage. As I said, this is a topic that uh, you know, the last six, nine months, a lot of people have been very interested in. Uh, a lot of changes, a lot of talk about it. Um, big announcements by uh, electric vehicle, by manufacturers about electric vehicle programs, um, how batteries might support the grid. And so we thought we'd try and introduce some of those, uh, those topics in today and how you might benefit from them too. So is it the next big thing? So what is battery storage? Well, it's been around for yeah, 150 years, um, and it's basically a way of storing energy. Yeah? Charge it up, discharge it, charge it up and when you've got excess, discharge it when you need it. Yeah, everyone's got a battery, everyone knows what a battery is, and they're really conceptually no, no different to the ones that run your torches and your mobile phones. The difference is scale, um, and we're talking hundreds of kilowatts, maybe even megawatt-sized batteries uh, when, you're talking, uh, when you're talking grid connected or renewable system connected battery storage sites. Their main technology types, I'll just look at them in a little bit more detail in a minute, but lead acid batteries, yeah, funny enough, people still are using them. And actually, we were involved in a battery storage project five years ago, um, a pilot project on a dairy farm, looking at a 50 kilowatt hour battery. Um, and the lead acid battery won on cost, hands down. Probably now, it wouldn't. Um, lithium ion technology, um, the cost of lithium ion batteries have come down significantly. And something some people are talking about flow batteries. Um, and I'll, you'll see what a flow battery is in a minute, but that's uh, some terminology that's just entering into the marketplace at the moment, and maybe that's got more validity to um, store vast quantities of energy than maybe lithium ion or lead acid. Just put this article up, and I think it just emphasizes where the state of the market is um, and why there's a sudden interest. Um, this is a, a speculator looking for sites for their battery storage facilities. Um, brownfield sites, underutilized warehouses, you know, we can put these batteries anywhere. Um, it don't necessarily have to be windy, doesn't necessarily have to be in sunny places, it could be in old buildings, don't require a great deal of space. And I think the, the one that gets everyone potential to earn significant revenue. Um, and we'll talk about how you can realize that. But at the moment, there is potential to earn significant revenue. There's a lot of interest in um, uh, supporting the grid uh, and being paid for doing so. And I guess that's the, uh, the impetus. Battery storage is an emerging industry. Grid capacity is being used up at a rapidly increasing rate. There's a scare story for you there, isn't there? Um, and being able to connect to the grid um, is absolutely essential for these, for these projects. And we all know that our grid is struggling. Anyone that's tried to connect to the grid recently or in the last two or three, four or five years will have found it increasingly difficult to do so. But there are some changes in there. People, the, the DNOs are getting a little bit uh, more lenient about where, they can, uh, where you can connect and what, where they can give you a time of day connection rather than um, saying no completely. So if you've had a grid connection in the, or refused in the past, maybe, yeah, maybe it's time to revisit it. So that's the, the impetus for it. Yeah, what's the state of the market? Well, fairly small scale. In March 16, there was only 24 megawatts of, of grid connection um, for battery storage. Suddenly in, uh, in August, the national grid contracted 200 megawatts, so ten, nearly 10 times as much. Um, over eight projects, and they're being built at the moment, um, or maybe even completed and commissioned by now. And they were um, sort of a one-off contract, provide frequency response services, um, support the grid when the frequency goes over or, or, or below what it needs to be. And then in July 17, apparently 500 megawatts have been contracted. Um, so they may, have, may or may not have already been built, but we're starting to see this rapid increase in, uh, in deployment the, there is an electricity, electricity storage network um, society uh, or association, as they call themselves. Funnily enough, there's trade associations for everything, isn't there? Um, and their aim is to have two gigawatts deployed by 2020. And the chances are they're going to get there because here's a, uh, a table from Western Power, and they reckon that they've accepted or have uh, people have accepted grid connection offers for 1.1 gigawatts already and they've offered capacity to another 1.1 gigawatts. So even just in the, the WPD area, there's your 2.2 gigawatts. Now, whether they, whether they get there by 2020 or not, who knows? And whether people have accepted an offer speculatively, 
Um, and actually, when it comes to the finances, they don't build. Again, who knows? But uh, it is moving fairly quickly. Um, and that level of deployment, you know, from 24 megawatts to, to 2 gigawatts, that out-accelerates RHI. Um, probably out accelerates uh, feed in tariff in the early days as well. So it's going, it's going pretty quickly. So the technologies, uh, again, uh, back to lead acid batteries. Yeah, they've been around since 1859. Uh, and they don't look very dissimilar now to what they did in 1859, really. Um, we're all very familiar with them. Um, and they've been the technology of choice for cars and, uh, and all sorts of things, uh, forklifts and the like. But they have a fairly low energy density. And what's really helped uh, perpetuate this uh, battery storage revolution, if we're going to call it a revolution, maybe evolution, is uh, the movement in lithium-ion technology. Um, so all of these are the same as you've got in your mobile phone, um, just lots and lots of them. And actually, if you look inside one of these battery storage facilities, um, such as the, the Tesla power pack, which you can, can see there, you will just see stacks and stacks and stacks of these batteries. And they've got a reasonable energy density, um, fairly unobtrusive, and yes, uh, they can catch fire as well, but uh, let's, let's gloss over Samsung for a minute. Um, they are the, becoming the technology of choice um, for battery storage facilities. <coughs> what might eclipse them, um, and maybe this is a bit of a future view, I think it's called flow batteries. They're a bit like heat storage, really, in that you've got a reservoir of liquid, vanadium redox in this particular case, um, you store it up, you charge up um, one side positively and the other side negatively, and then you run it against each other and discharge it to get the power out of it, to get the energy out of it. The liquid stores the energy, the membrane, the separator in the middle, that tells you how quickly you can charge or discharge it. You know, that's the way of getting the charge in and out of it. The great thing about these is actually if you want to increase your energy storage capacity, you want to store more energy, then you increase the size of the tank of liquid. If you want to increase your power out of it, then you increase the size of the, uh, of the membrane in the middle rather than just stacking up more and more batteries. And some people say that this is where the technology will, uh, or where battery storage really needs to go because uh, a lot of situations don't require high power density, but they do require quite a lot of energy storage capability. Um, and so the, the flow battery revolution maybe is, is the one to keep an eye on in terms of supporting renewable energy systems not necessarily for supporting grid systems, because supporting grid systems require instantaneous power requirement. But actually, if you want to store energy over a long term and then discharge it over a long term, then maybe a flow battery is more suited to you than, uh, than a bank of lithium-ion cells. The commercial reality, though, is still lithium-ion. Um, lithium-ion battery costs are falling rapidly. Uh, and here we have a graph of, of costs of lithium ions, uh, dollars per megawatt hour actually, uh, or dollars per kilowatt hour. Um, there's three different uh, columns on there. The dark blue is static energy storage systems. The light blue is lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles. And the gray is just a, a, an average. So looking at the, the automotive, um, the cost of them over five years, from 2010 to 2015, 65% reduction in cost of producing lithium-ion battery cell. Uh, static systems, not quite such a dramatic decrease, but still 35% drop. And if we, if we head that towards 2020, then, then further still drops in, in costs. And that's going to be quite important um, because as the, the benefits may come down slightly in terms of, uh, of income and revenues, but if the costs fall further than, uh, faster than that, then maybe we will be seeing battery stores connected to uh, renewable energy systems and people systems a lot quicker than, uh, uh, than they would at today's costs. The reason for this is yeah, effectively an increase in capacity, a lot of people jumping into the market to make lithium-ion batteries, um, mostly driven by the electric vehicle um, marketplace. And I say most people can't fail to see the announcements by Ford and uh, Jaguar Land Rover and VW and the like about where their aspirations for, for vehicles are. And the UK government's own announcement that we should outlaw petrol and diesel engines. And so there's a, there's a lot of movement in that. And so lithium ion is still the technology to, to, um, to consider now, uh, maybe in you know, three, four years' time. There's also been a lot of announcements, you know, not just advancements in technology, but a lot of changes in, or 
consulting on changes in the, in the marketplace, regulation changes, even the national grid changes. So system needs and product strategy, that's a snappy title, isn't it? Um, yeah, how, how do we support the grid? Um, what services does the grid need to support uh, to be supported? Yeah, we're losing inertia in the system. Um, as, as older power stations come to the end of their life, that underpinned the, underpinned the grid um, and helped it out when in times of stress by just having that, uh, that base load. We need things that can react faster and faster and faster. Um, yeah, we've got lots of distributed generation, lots of little combined heat and power systems, and even you know, two or three megawatts is still considered a little combined heat and power system compared to, to a power station. And they can all play their part in supporting the grid, but it's, it's responsiveness that we need, and that's uh, uh, the purpose of that <coughs> consultation from National Grid. Um, <coughs> things called capacity market, uh, which we'll, Tim will talk a little bit more detail about later on. Um, but uh, how we might pay for these, how, how we might support them through payments, so that's from the Department of Business. Um, and even Ofgem getting in on the act, um, what's the plan to, you know, from Ofgem, the regulator, in how the grid should be supported? Followed by announcements from government, yeah, we're going to pile into battery research as well. Here's 45 million to go and build a research centre, still very much centred around electric vehicles, um, but the way of thinking is, is heading towards supporting battery systems generally as well. Um, subtle changes like being able to get rocks um, from charging your batteries from a renewable source is, is one thing they're thinking of. Reducing some of the import uh, charges, the embedded benefit charges um, on, on importing electricity to charge your batteries. All subtle slight changes that help out a system but uh, um, just show the way the government's thinking in terms of having uh, support from batteries. So that's all of that stuff. So what do you actually need then? So here is a, um, a 500 kilowatt, 250 kilowatt hour, uh, sorry, 500 kilowatt hour, 250 kilowatt system that was installed back in September last year um, in the corner of a field in Somerset. So those are your batteries, in this case Tesla, um, as evidenced by the tiny little Tesla logo on it. Uh, those are the batteries. Those are your inverters and controls. That's where you connect to the grid. You don't necessarily need the policy advisor from the NFU in your system. Um, might, might hinder it or help it, who knows. Um, and your grid connection. That's what you need. And really, what differs um, is the size of this lot. Uh, you know, bigger barns, bigger facilities, uh, maybe covering them, maybe not covering them. But that is a system. Um, and most systems will, will look very similar, feel very similar to that. And as you can see, it doesn't take up a huge amount of space. Um, <coughs> doesn't necessarily need to be allied to a renewable system. Uh, this one actually is uh, coexisting with a, with a large solar array, but it does no help for that at all. It just so happens that conveniently there was a grid connection that could be used that was next to that PV array. And that system exists solely to support the grid. And I talked about it, the August 2016 contracts. Uh, 200 megawatts to support the grid. Well, this is one of those systems um, providing frequency response services. And I stood by that for all, um, half, three quarters of an hour and it kicked in and out probably you know, 30 or 40 times in that, uh, in that period. You know, sometimes for a few seconds, sometimes for a minute or so. And that's what you need. Key really in these is the grid connection. And I've put sound familiar up there. I think... We're always talking about the grid connection. Uh, the last three or four events of this, we've talked about the grid connection for one reason or another, whether it's putting in CHP or, or um, thinking about other renewable systems. Is there spare capacity on the system? I talked a little bit about, uh, or mentioned the DNOs being slightly less concerned about saying uh, no and a bit more concerned about saying yes and how they might say yes, giving you time of day connections or even looking at the existing capacity uh, on the site and saying yes there is some spare capacity because what you applied for you're not actually using. Don't forget you need an import and an export requirement. You've got to charge these things up as well as discharge them. Um, so they're not renewable energy systems in that regard. So it's an import and an export requirement. And, yeah, for example, you've got a PV system, you've applied for, you know, two or three megawatts of export capacity, but when you look at it, your peak capacity on export is only one and a half to two megawatts, then maybe there's a bit of spare capacity there to have a, to have a battery system. So grid connection is key, 
And again, just like in the early days of solar panels, people are, are now going to be knocking on your door and saying, can I have some exclusivity to, uh, to look at the grid connections in your area to think about putting in a battery storage system? Um, and we're seeing those, uh, those coming with increasing frequency now to our, uh, to our call center. The practicalities are you don't need very much space. Um, and a lot of people will talk about containerized systems. Uh, 1,000 square meters plus, well, that's going to be a fairly large system. Um, you know, three or four containers with access. Um, in reality, if you look at this system, it's probably only you know, a couple of hundred square meters, if that. Uh, but most people will talk about a third of an acre plus um, so that they can make sure that they've got enough um, space to get their lorries in and uh, servicing vans and all sorts of things to, to get a system established. Don't necessarily have to be in a building. Um, some will want buildings, some will not want buildings. Some will be shipping containers stacked high. Um, these ones sit outside. A lot of concern about them being white. Don't really know what, what the problem is with white, but if you don't want them... Uh, to be white and you want them green, then I'm afraid you can't have that from Tesla, so you'll have to put it into a building. But buildings, yes, small agricultural building size, portal frames, um, that's the sort of thing that, the, that these uh, battery st systems will go into. And you may want to do that for security reasons anyway, or stick a security fence around them. Um, there are such things as Tesla spotters, would you believe? There are people who go out there and look for the Tesla logo on things, and that's why this one, the location of that has been kept secret. <laughs> yeah, I quite agree, Colin. <laughs> um, prominence, actually, they're not very prominent at all. Um, you wouldn't know that was there unless you walked around the corner and saw it. There is a bit of high-frequency noise, cooling fans kicking in and out, no worse than an air conditioning system. Uh, ironically, if you do put them in a building, then the cooling... Uh, the cooling requirement will be higher, so there'll be more cooling fans. But they're not very prominent at all. Um, they don't take up a lot of space. They, uh, they're not big blue blots on the landscape, as some people consider PV systems to be. They're not like wind turbines. They're not even like biomass boilers with a bit of steam coming out of the chimney. Um, you know, they can be hidden very easily, and people hardly know that they're there. I guess the question is, what do you want the system to do? Um, are you wanting it to provide some off-grid power support? Um, chances are you'd be considering a flow battery if you were thinking along those lines, if you could afford it, or um, small-scale lithium-ion. Uh, do you want it behind the grid meter? Well, behind the grid meter means supporting you rather than supporting the grid. So maybe you've got a, a PV system that uh, you want to save some of that power for your own use, save some of that energy for your own use, or your connection isn't big enough to put it all onto the grid at one time, and so you need to divert it somewhere during um, high sunlight hours and eke it out throughout the day. Um, or maybe you just want to you know, trade the market, buy low, sell high, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, or still capacity support, in which case you're, you're talking about a lithium-ion system still. And grid services, um, you want to be contracted to the national grid maybe, maybe you want to help them out, maybe you want to get those, uh, those enhancements. So you've got to think about what you want the system for because the technology um, may be different, the setup of the system will certainly be different, and the amount of revenue that you get will definitely be different. I suppose the reality is simple economics of, of behind-the-meter systems uh, look a bit like this. You know, uh, buying low, sell high. Don't forget you've got a bit of inefficiency. They're not a, in, in and out. Um, you don't get out what you put in, funnily enough. So let's say you can buy at 5 and sell at 10. Um, so you're going to be buying 500 kilowatt hours. You're going to be selling 400 kilowatt hours because of your efficiency um, effect. That's about five and a half thousand pounds a year. Maybe if you could do that twice a day, you could double that to, to 11,000 pounds a year. It's still not enough to offset these current costs of, a, of around that sort of a level. And so the simple truth is that whilst everyone thinks that, uh, that batteries are going to be able to enable them to trade or, or help them out, actually the economics currently don't work as an, in, as an investment. Now, if you're off-grid, if you've got a, got a different problem, then the, then, the, then the factors will change. But buying low, selling high, doesn't necessarily, or doesn't currently work for, for battery storage systems. 
So what are the people doing then? And this is typical of, a, of an announcement. This is in a magazine or an online magazine called The Energist. Um, most businesses looking at it are predicting somewhere between a three and a seven year payback. Well, that's not what my numbers said. Uh, so what are they doing? Well, it is these grid support services. Um, they surveyed those people that said three to seven year payback. Most of them said that they were going to get uh, grid services, demand side response, capacity market, play the wholesale market, peak charge avoidance. And so they're thinking about stacking up, which is a term that uh, you may become familiar with over the afternoon, stacking up some of these things in order to get their three to seven year payback. Um, the reality of that sometimes is that you can't stack certain things with other things. So uh, you've got to look at a project quite closely to make sure you can get what you think you can get. Uh, that's what that says, stacking up. <coughs> So, as I say, the reality is um, people putting in battery systems are doing it to support the grid. Um, get the support payments for things like frequency response, when the frequency goes out of, uh, out of kilter, capacity market, making sure that we have uh, uh, enough capacity for when we need it, and triads of, triad avoidance, um, trying to get those payments for those three half hour periods in uh, November to February. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about them because that um, uh, leads into what Tim will tell you in a minute. Uh, but those can give you that seven-year payback-ish, uh, 10 to 12% return. And so if you're thinking about these systems, that's where you're probably going to end up with at the moment, unless costs come down faster or the value of the electricity arbitrage, the price arbitrage goes, uh, goes greater than it currently is. Are they here to stay? Well, yeah, here's my crystal ball gazing for a minute. There aren't any incentive schemes. So you know, unlike the RHI and the feed-in tariff where we're prepared to take a risk on something because there's a 20-year return, currently contracting these things um, with the grid is going to give you a contract less than five years, and in some cases less than that. So you've got to think of them as a fairly short-term investment currently. Um, what I would say is don't underestimate the impact that electric vehicles will have. And actually, they could um, cause as many problems as they solve or solve as many problems as they cause because they're all mini storage systems as well. And you can paint a doomsday scenario where everybody gets home at 6 o'clock and plugs in their electric vehicle and causes the grid to go into meltdown, um, in which case we might need lots of secondary batteries to, to help get over that. Or actually, we could all be trading a little bit smarter and saying, you know, we'll, we'll not plug ours in yet or we'll set our timer on our battery on our electric vehicle to, uh, to charge at a different time and eke that out through the day. If you believe the way the market is moving, we're all going to be trading on time of day tariffs anyway, um, even at a domestic level at some point in the future. And if that is the case, then the chances are we don't need huge battery stores because we'll all be driving around in one um, post-2020. And when people like these get involved, um, yeah, they're going to have a big impact. So in summary, <coughs> battery storage systems, make sure you know what you want, you want the system for so that you can get the right technology. Make sure the economics work for you uh, in your particular circumstance. And just because it works for the guy down the road doesn't mean that it will work for you. And obviously, if you haven't got a grid connection, then you're going to struggle. As prices are coming down, as, you know, as people get more familiar with it, then haggle on price, try and get that investment to work for you as well as it can. And just keep an eye on those policy changes. As fast moving as the, as the market is, um, because what's here today could be gone tomorrow, or what, what's not here today could be um, an opportunity tomorrow. OK. <coughs> so brief introduction to battery storage there. Um, Tim is going to take over a little bit on some of the grid support side of things. I think take the opportunity to take questions after that, because they're probably very, two very link in very well together, if that's OK with everybody, um, and invite Tim to come to the stage. Um, as I said, just to leave you with this thought, Grow Save News, you get a copy of that. There's actually a bit of a write-up about battery storage in there um, that might just help underpin some of the knowledge today. Thank you very much. Thank you.